now. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Amen, amen. If you can turn with me to the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 3. And uh, so thankful for the presence of the Lord that is here. Amen. I wish a pastor and bishop were home more than anybody. Amen. But uh, we will pray that God brings them home safely. And uh, I don't know that I have a Sunday night message tonight. I don't know what to tell you, but I do feel that the Lord wants to talk to our hearts in the next few moments tonight. I don't plan on preaching long. I told Brother Darren a minute ago, I said, it's, it's a holiday tomorrow. I said, I'm going to preach for three hours. He said, I'm gone in 45 minutes. <laughs> Amen. He'd stick with me. Amen. Ecclesiastes. I'm going to read through this quickly. It's a very familiar portion of Scripture, but I do want to read all the way through uh, 11 verses here, but we will, we will move quickly. Amen. To everything, there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven. A time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, a time to pluck up that which is planted. A time to kill, a time to heal time to break down, a time to build up, a time to weep, a time to laugh, a time to mourn, a time to dance, a time to cast away stones, a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace, a time to refrain from embracing, a time to get, a time to lose, a time to keep, a time to cast away, a time to rend, a time to sow, a time to keep silence, a time to speak time to love, a time to hate, a time of war, a time of peace. What profit hath he that worketh in that wherein he laboreth? I've seen the travail which God hath given to the sons of men to be exercised in it. And then verse 11. He hath made everything beautiful in his time. And we usually stop there, and it's beautiful, and it's, it's, it, it, it's, it's a great place to stop. But I want to keep going to the end of this verse tonight. Also, he hath set the world in their heart so that no man can find out the work or the purpose that God maketh from the beginning to the end. How many know that God has got it all under control? If you've come with questions in your mind tonight, you just, you've lived for God for a long time, or maybe you just started down this path, but sometimes things just, man, it just don't make sense. I've come to tell you tonight, God, he's got it under control. He's a great big God, and he's got it under control. I'm going to say it again. He's a great big God, and he's got it under control. He knows exactly what he's doing tonight. For the next few moments tonight, I just want to preach to you an unchanging God in an ever-changing world. An unchanging God in an ever, ever ever-changing world. You can put your Bibles down for a moment tonight. Let's just pray and ask that God would talk to our hearts in the next few minutes tonight. Jesus. God, we love you. God, we magnify you. We stand in awe of your presence tonight. God, we ask that you would speak to our hearts. God, in the next few moments, God, talk to us. Talk to us tonight, God. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen, amen, amen. You may be seated. A subtitle, you do not have to put this up there, but would be The Unchanging Purpose of God. Solomon, when he's writing this, he begins to explain, and this is just the Adam paraphrase, you're going to go through all kinds of stuff in life. It's very practical as he begins to go through this. 
He covers every aspect of life, time to born and die and plant and pluck up and kill and heal and break down and build up. And he goes through these weep and laugh and mourn and dance. And he covers almost every aspect of life as he goes through this. But in reading this a while back, it stood out to me that he, he makes some distinctions that I think are very, very important for you and I to see. In verse 1, you say, well, you're, you're splitting hairs here, but I'm going to prove out my point, I believe, in the next few moments. But in the verse 1, he says, to every thing, there is a season and a time to every purpose under heaven. Can you say under heaven with me tonight? It's no accident that he uses this verbiage. This verbiage of under heaven is used 13 times in the Old Testament. And it's used usually in places like Genesis chapter 6 when it's speaking of the flood. And he talks about the destroying of everything under heaven. It's a significant note because when he destroyed the earth with water, it did not affect heaven. And that's an important point for you to understand tonight, that it didn't affect heaven. And when he's making this distinction in verse 1, he's saying, hey, there's things that are going to happen. There's times and seasons. But he pauses for a moment there, and he says, these things are the things that happen under heaven. I don't believe it's an accident that he words it like this. I think when we go to verse 11, the reason I read the last part of this verse, many times we stop when he says, he hath made everything beautiful in his time. And we're speaking about those times and seasons, but then he goes on to clarify when he makes the statement, no man can find out the work or the purpose that God maketh from the beginning to the end. You read this in the New Living Translation, and it says, yet God has made everything beautiful for its own time. He has planted eternity in the human heart, but even so people cannot see the whole scope of God's work from the beginning of the end. Can I just pause right now and tell you something right now? All of those things that were listed a moment ago and all of those seasons, uh, those things do not affect what God is doing in the big picture of life. Uh, all of those things happen, whether, whether we're mourning a death or, or we're rejoicing over a, a, some, a, someone being born, uh, whether something is being planted or plucked up or broke down or built up or weeping or laughing, that that does not affect God, and it does not affect the purpose of God, and it does not affect the plan of God. I know sometimes that, that, that kind of bothers us, and let me just tell you, if we're going through something, to think of it like this, it's like, God, don't you see what I'm going through? And yes, he does, but you got to get it tonight. It still doesn't affect the purpose of God. The NIV says no one can fathom what God has done from the beginning to the end. This is at the end of that passage where he's talking about seasons. You've heard it quoted time after time, but at the beginning it says, hey, all of these things are happening under heaven. And he goes to the end of this passage and he closes it out and says, hey, no man can know what's going on from the beginning to the end. Reiterating, all of those things are going to happen. Life is going to happen. You're going to go through seasons. He covers every aspect of it. But don't ever forget, it doesn't affect God and it doesn't affect the plan of God and it doesn't affect the purpose of God. Whether you're in a season, I'm going to go through these because you got to get it tonight. you got to catch this. Whether it's the season of, uh, of being born or dying, it does not change the purpose of God. Whether planting or plucking up, it doesn't change the plan of God. Whether there's killing or healing, it doesn't change the purpose of God. Whether rending or sowing, it doesn't change the purpose of God. Wherever you find yourself tonight, it doesn't change what God has planned to do in your life. 
to sort of encourage somebody tonight. Uh, everything that's going on in this crazy world or, or possibly everything going on in your life, it does not affect God's purpose. It does not affect God's plan. It doesn't affect God's intention. He had a plan from the beginning of time for all mankind, but I believe specifically to you and I, and his plan is not affected by what's going on in this world. Hallelujah. Luke 19 and 10 says it like this. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which is lost. Can I just, can I just cut to the chase and tell you tonight, no matter the season... It's revival time. No matter the season, it's Bible study time. No matter the season, it's church going time. Come on. you got to put it in perspective. No matter what's going on in your life, God's still got a purpose. Hallelujah. We see all through Scripture where there's a distinction made. Interesting enough, in the New Testament alone, the phrase, the kingdom of God, is used 69 times. In Matthew, only in Matthew, this phrase is when I saw this. I'm going to go back to this because I'm very curious about it. But only in Matthew, it's referenced as the kingdom of heaven. It's referenced over 40 times. This making a distinction between, in a sense, our world where we live day to day and God's world where he lives. God's kingdom in our kingdom. And as Brother Brown said this morning, he stole my notes, I think. He began to talk about getting our purpose aligned. And I'm getting ahead of myself, but you hear me tonight. Getting our purpose aligned with God's purpose. That's the key to everything. Getting my purpose aligned with his purpose. He's got a purpose that never changes. And I want my purpose to align with his purpose. And it gives me perspective from what I'm going through day to day. Hallelujah. We see examples of this, Matthew 6 and 9, familiar portion of Scripture. Disciples are asking Jesus to teach them to pray. He says, and after this manner, therefore pray ye, our Father which art is in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And then we move through this so quickly many times. But he says, thy kingdom come. He's telling us this is how you pray. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven, making a distinction there. Hey, things are different. Things are thought about different. Things are viewed different. We can see farther. There, there's vision there when you talk about the kingdom of heaven. And he's saying, hey, when you're praying, you need to start praying, God, let me see things like you see things. Let me understand that the kingdom like you understand the kingdom. That's what Ecclesiastes was all about. Solomon was saying, hey, you're going to go through a bunch of stuff. You're going to go through stuff you don't understand. It's seasons and it's life. And sometimes it's not fun. And sometimes it's glorious. But don't you ever forget. Get God's got a purpose, and none of that stuff affects God's purpose. You got to align yourself with His purpose. Hallelujah. We find Jesus at 12 years old. His family goes to Jerusalem for the feast of the Passover. And when they leave, they don't realize that Jesus is not with them. And Luke chapter 2, verse 46 says, And it came to pass that after three days they found him in the temple. This is Mary, the mother of Jesus. You want to talk about seasons? Let's talk about three days not knowing where your kid is. We read this story and it's just... We focus in on Jesus being in the temple, and we're going to look at that in a moment, and it's special, and it's, it's beautiful. But let's back up for a minute. They leave. They're in this caravan, and they're going home, and I'm sure there's lots of people, and I'm sure there's family, and I'm sure the assumption was made that Jesus is hanging out with uncle so-and-so or auntie so-and-so. And then when it comes time where mama starts saying, hey, have you seen Jesus? No. Have you seen Jesus? No. Where's Jesus? And this verse tells us that it was three days before they found him in the temple. Let's slow down for a minute. Three days where mama 
is going through a season of absolute terror. I don't know what was going through her mind. I can't even begin to imagine. I remember times back when my children were younger and, and misplacing them when you're in a mall or something for two minutes, three minutes. Hey, where's the baby? Where's the baby? I don't know. You look around a clothes rack, and they're playing in the clothes, and, and you find them. But even in that moment of time, your heart drops. I don't know what Mary was going through, but you want to talk about seasons? She was going through a season. But when you begin to read the rest of the verse, and, and, and she finds him sitting there, and he says to them, and, and he, he's confounding them when he's sitting there talking to them in the temple. And it says, he said unto them, how is it that you sought me? Wish she not that I must be about my father's business. You understand at a young age, at 12 years old, there was a higher purpose. And I'm trying to convey something to you. Even Mary went through this where she didn't understand. There was a time of terror. But oh, Mary, it's bigger than you. I'm not being disrespectful, Mary, but it's bigger than you. This is, this is a big deal. And you hear me tonight. There's going to be times in your life where you got to pause and say, it's bigger than me. I don't understand it. I don't have the answers. This doesn't make sense, and this doesn't seem fair. I've been faithful to the house of God. Can I get down to where we live? I've been faithful in giving. I've paid my tithes, and God, I don't understand why I'm going through this. I'm not making light of that tonight. It's just a season, and God has still got a plan that has never changed from the beginning of time. Hallelujah! Understanding the purpose of God allows us to understand our purpose. Getting hooked up to the purpose of God. You want to know what your purpose is? We're going to cover some of it tonight, but we're just going to touch the tops of the waves here. you got to start studying out, God, what's your purpose, what's your desire, because I want to follow after that. Luke 4 says it like this. I'm going to move through this quickly because this is not the absolute point of where I'm going tonight. But Luke 4 uh, opens up with Jesus going into the wilderness. And in verse 1 it says, And Jesus being full of the Holy Ghost returned from Jordan, was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being 40 days tempted of the devil. And in those days he did eat nothing. And they were ended. He afterward hungered. So we see Jesus has come out of the wilderness for 40 days enduring the temptation of the devil. Verse 14 says, And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee, and there went out a fame of him through all the region round about. So we find him at the beginning of his ministry. No parables yet, no miracles yet, but establishing his purpose. One commentator wrote it like this. He says, having defended himself against the devil's assaults, he now begins his offensive. You skip down to verse 17. You see that Jesus is in Nazareth where he was raised. He's in the synagogue on the Sabbath. And verse 17 says, and there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he... Everyone say he had opened the book. He found the place where it's written. He could have went anywhere. He could have read anywhere. He could have picked anywhere to read. But it says Jesus comes back, his opening salvo. And he says, bring me the book. And he opens the book. And the scripture says he found the place where it is written. Fulfilling the prophecy of Isaiah 61, he even says in verse 21, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. At that point, if anybody's wondering what the purpose was, Jesus is getting ready to make it really clear. And in verse 18, very familiar portion of scripture, but you understand the context now. He says the spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. 
His opening salvo, he continues, he says, he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and the recovering of sight to the blind, set at liberty to them that are bruised. His opening salvo, bring me the book. There's a place in there I want to read from. This day is this prophecy fulfilled, and I'm going to read this portion of Scripture. You want to know what the purpose of God is. You want to know what the opening salvo is. He said, hey, it's to preach the gospel to the poor, to heal the brokenhearted, to deliver the captive, to recover sight to the blind, and set at liberty to them that are bruised. You hear me tonight. God's got a purpose, and it has never changed, and it will never change. When we begin to align ourselves, and I'm going to move quickly through this, uh, with his purpose, and focus with his purpose, you understand so much. I'm going to go quickly, but I'm going to do it because it's important, and this is a doctrinal foundation, and it's our purpose. Hallelujah. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4 says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, just in case you didn't know, which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have delivered in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scripture, and that ye and he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. You understand, if you're not familiar with this, that this gospel message that he said his purpose would be is the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Death and repentance, burial and baptism in Jesus' name, and resurrection through the infilling of the Holy Ghost. That's the gospel message. Hallelujah. And if you ever wondered why there's so much emphasis put on that, and in the Lighthouse Church, let me tell you why. Because it's the primary purpose of God. That is what it's all about. People receiving the gospel. Hallelujah. You understand. i got to move quickly. I don't want Darren walking out on me. you got to understand that everything prior to the book of Acts points forward to something happening. Everything after the book of Acts points back to something that happened, hallelujah, and you understand what happened, happened in the book of Acts. Example of this is John 7, 37. I hope this doesn't bore you, apostolic. This is an example. In the last day, that gray of the day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, if any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. Come on. We're talking about the purpose of God. He that believeth on me, as the scripture have said, out of his belly flow rivers of living water. But here's the key, and understand this, but this spake he of the spirit which they that believed on him should receive for the Holy Ghost was not yet, everyone say yet was not yet given because that Jesus was not yet glorified, speaking of something to come, something's going to happen something's about to happen Luke 24 and 45 then he opened their, their understanding this is after he died and rose again and he begins to talk to them and tell them that they might understand the scriptures and he said to them, thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. And here it comes, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem, pointing ahead again, pointing ahead to something happen. And ye are witnesses of these things. And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. But tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued from on high. Can we keep going? Acts 2. Here it comes. Everything before that. We didn't go into the Old Testament, but let me just tell you, everything points towards something happening. Everything's saying, hey, it's going to happen. Something's going to happen. Something's going to happen. And then when the day of Pentecost was fully come, can we go there? Can we go there today? Uh, they are all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing. Come on, we're talking about the purpose of God. You want to know what God's purpose is? This is the purpose of God right here. And there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind. It filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire and set upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. The fulfillment of the promise in Luke. 
the fulfillment of the promise in John, the fulfillment of the promise in Joel, the purpose of God. Hallelujah. Seasons come. Seasons go. But the purpose of God, you hear me, never changes. I don't care what the government's doing. I don't care what the pan, I don't, you call it a pandemic, whatever you want to call it. COVID, this, that, other. You hear me? The purpose of God doesn't change. What do we do, preacher? Look what's happening. Look what's on the news. Look, look what's happening in this country and that country and all the rest. And I'm not making light of that. Let me tell you what happens. You just keep preaching the gospel because the purpose of God doesn't change. You hear me when the decision was made to still have church. I'm not being disrespectful right now. During COVID, it had nothing to do politically. It had no, we weren't trying to make any point with anybody or prove anything. It simply was the fact that the purpose of God doesn't change. It was still the will of God for people to get the Holy Ghost, be baptized in Jesus' name. It's important that you understand it. You hear me? Because you're going to wake up tomorrow morning, and there's going to be some kind of news. And and more and more, I read something, and I say, why am I even reading this junk? It depresses me. You hear me? Don't ever forget the purpose of God doesn't change no matter what happens. It's still the will of God for you to teach a Bible study. It's still the will of God for people to be baptized in Jesus' name and filled with the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. I got to hurry. Everything before the book of Acts points to something happening. Then it happens in the book of Acts. That's why it's called the book of Acts, the book of actions. And then as you get into the epistles, you understand that he's talking to people that have already experienced this. And I'm going to move through these quickly, but I just want to lock down my point here. He goes to the church of Galatia, and he begins to talk to them. In chapter 1, verse 6, he says, Hey, I marvel that you're so soon removed from him that called you unto grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another. But there be some that trouble you would pervert the gospel. In other words, the gospel that you received and the gospel that you heard, the death, burial, and resurrection, in case you didn't catch it a minute ago. He says they begin to pervert it. Hey, you know, baptism is not important. Receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost, you know, that, that, that was for back then. That was for that time. You hear me. Let's continue to read what he told the church of Galatia, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we are an angel, he says, hey, listen, I'm the one that witnessed to you, but you, let me tell you something. If I ever get messed up in my head and I come back to you and I start telling you something different or an angel comes and tells you something different, he goes on to say, let them be accursed. Why? Because the purpose of God never changes. The gospel that was preached prior to the book of Acts, fulfilled in the book of Acts, it does not change. Hallelujah. But then he got a little bit worried. He said, maybe they didn't catch it. And he goes on in verse 9, and he says, hey, as we said before in verse 8, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. He's telling them, hey, It doesn't change. Times and seasons change. And there's a bunch of them. You can go read them in Ecclesiastes 3. But the purpose of God will never change. He goes on to the church at Ephesus. In chapter 1, verse 13. In whom he also trusted after that ye heard. Pointing back. The word of truth. The gospel of your salvation. In whom also after that ye believed ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Do I need to tell you? It's the gift of the Holy Ghost. He talks to the church at Thessalonica, 1 Thessalonians 1 and 5, for our gospel came not 
unto you in word only, but also whoo, in power, in the Holy Ghost, in much assurance as ye know what matter of men were among you for your sake. Everything pointing back. Got time for one more? Romans 1 says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. You want to know what the gospel is? It's the power of God unto salvation. That's why it's important. God has no, no more intention of what he wants most is for people to be saved. Hallelujah. Let's move on to the next one. I'm not going to spend that much time on these. This isn't completely where I'm headed. Amen. The next one was to heal the brokenhearted. I think it's important you understand. Maybe you haven't heard me say it tonight. If you haven't, the purpose of God doesn't change. And don't ever forget in his opening salvo, he says, yeah, to preach the gospel to the poor. And then he says, my next intention is to heal the brokenhearted. God looked down through time. He saw the world's condition in 2023 and said, you want to know what I'm going to do in 2023? I'm going to heal the brokenhearted. This world's full of pain and hurt and broken promises and broken dreams. But there's a healer in the house. You hear me right now. I'd be remiss if I didn't tell you right now, this minute, hallelujah, if you've walked into this place tonight and you've been crushed and you've been hurt and you've been broken and people have done you wrong, you hear me tonight, there's a God in this house that his entire purpose for going to the cross and dying for you was not only the gospel so that you're saved, but he wants to heal your broken hearted. He doesn't want to just make you feel better. He wants to heal your broken heart. He wants to take care of you. Psalms 30 and 5 says, weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. Let God have that hurt tonight. <laughs> Hallelujah. Number three, I need to hurry. Preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind. This deliverance he's referring to is a deliverance from the bondage of sin. He's reaching for those that have never known freedom. Let me just tell you tonight, if you've never received the gift of the Holy Ghost, what we've just been talking about, I'm telling you, you can receive the gift of the Holy Ghost tonight. Yay, it's God's purpose. I said it's God's purpose. That, that, that's why we're here, folks. If you think there's any other reason that we're here, that people would come into this place and receive the gift of the Holy Ghost and be healed of their broken heart and deliverance, you hear me, then you're missing it. It's the purpose of God. Everything preached from this pulpit goes back to the purpose of God. Everything preached from this pulpit is for redemption. It's God's purpose. So he was reaching to those that possibly had never known this. John 8, 32 says, And ye shall know the truth, the truth shall make you free. But the second part of this verse is also referring to deliverance, but it says recovering of sight. This is just my simple thinking. As Brother Philip said, his kindergarten Sunday school brain, maybe I got one too. If it's recovering, it means it used to be there. I believe the first part of this is those that maybe have never known it. But the second part of this, you understand his purpose is covering everything. It's, it's covering all the bases. He's reaching to those. He's saying, hey, you had sight for a while there, but something happened. And, and something clouded your vision. And darkness came back. And he said, you want to know what my purpose is? I'm not only reaching to those that have never known truth, but I'm reaching to those that have walked away from truth. You hear me tonight. The purpose of God is reaching to those that need recovery of sight tonight. First Peter 2 and 9 says, but ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar your people that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into this marvelous light. You hear me tonight. If you've walked in light and somehow darkness has crept in, God's reaching for you tonight. He wants you to recover your sight tonight. The fourth point, 
and I'm hurrying, is to set at liberty them that are bruised. This is an entire message in itself, and I've, I've preached about this before, but this is interesting to me. Why does somebody that is bruised need to be liberated? That's what the verse says, set at liberty them that are bruised. How does that make sense? A bruise is an injury appearing as an area of discolored skin, Webster says, on the body caused by a blow or an impact. A lot of times, bruises aren't seen. You don't know if somebody has a bruise unless it's a visible area. There's a whole thing about bone bruises. There's such deep bruises that they don't even mark on the skin, but the, the bone is bruised. Bruises. Have you ever been bruised by somebody? Somebody said something to you or offended you. And Jesus knew that's not just going to take a little ointment. He needed to set them at liberty. I don't want to get bogged down here. I said it already. This could be a complete message in itself, but you hear me tonight. Those pains and those hurts, you hear me. I'm talking to somebody right now. Those things that nobody knows about, those injuries that nobody sees, God, from the beginning of time, said, you want to know what my purpose is? I care about that kind of stuff. And I'm not just going to help them. I'm going to set at liberty. I'm going to set at liberty. I'm going to say it again. I'm going to set at liberty them that are bruised. I'm going to tell you something tonight, friend. God knows where you're at. And his purpose is never going to change. His purpose has always been the same. In his opening salvo, he said, hey, I want to find people like that. You want to know what my purpose is? I'm going to set at liberty to them. But let me tell you something. you got to bring it to Jesus. you got to give it to him. you got, you got to allow him to help you tonight. We're talking about the unchanging purpose of God. When you realize God's purpose does not change. And that as a child of God, you tie into this purpose. It puts everything else in perspective. It really does. The purpose of God, and you hear me, I'm not making light of anybody's situation tonight, but just just let me roll here for a minute. The purpose of God is bigger than your situation. And I'm not making light of it, but the purpose of God is more important than your situation. And sometimes we don't like to think like that. If you've ever lost a loved one to start thinking like that, it's almost ludicrous. You're thinking, how in the world could could this be true? But I'm telling you the purpose of God. It's the manifold wisdom of God. And and the scripture says we look through a glass darkly. We can't even see it clearly at this point. But you hear me? The purpose of God is bigger than you and I. The times and seasons in my life, they never change the purpose of God. I'm going to slow down here for a moment because I want to convey this to you. And it, it, it's, it's an article I read. I shared it with Brother Preston this last week. And I will not go through it word for word. But just ride with me for a minute, okay? I know it's Sunday night, but just we're going to slow down just for a minute. This article I read says, the question of why. I'm close to being done. This simple question, it's loaded with assumptions. And philosophers come up with a word for this study, and it's called teleology. T-E-L-E-O-L-O-G-Y. And teleology is the explanation of a phenomenon or event in terms of the purpose that it serves. Teleology, which comes from the Greek word for goal or end, telos. It's the study of purpose, this this why question. The why question, it's a purpose question. And humanity seeks reasons for things 
and why they happen. When we raise the question of purpose, it's concerning the end or the aim or the goal. And all of these terms suggest intent. They assume that there's a meaning for it rather than just things happening for just meaningless. It's just we as people were searching for an answer. To explain why we're not doing something is to give a reason or purpose for not doing it. Purpose always remains in the background. Human beings are creatures committed to purpose. We do things for a reason with some kind of goal in mind. But still there's this complexity in this quest purpose. And this is what I want us, I want to tie this spiritually tonight. I think scripture proves it out. There's this complexity in this quest. And hear me for the next minute. We distinguish between, they called it proximate and remote purpose. The now, and can I say the eternal. The now purpose and the eternal purpose. The proximate being what is close at hand. The remote referring to distant, ultimate, eternal purpose. I'll give you an analogy really quickly here that they gave. A sports analogy would be the proximate goal for a football team's offensive line is to get a first down. The remote purpose or the further away purpose is win the game and win the Super Bowl. You understand that you look at the story in the Old Testament. Musicians, start making your way. Don't play yet. Just make your way. In the Old Testament, Concerning this proximate and remote purpose is found in the story of Joseph. I want you to hear this tonight. You've been wondering why you're going through what you're going through. I want want you to get perspective tonight. At the story's end, the story of Joseph, Joseph's brothers, they begin to express their fear that he will take revenge on them for all that they've done to him. And Joseph's response shows us remarkable Concurrence at work between proximate and remote purpose. He said in Genesis 50 and 20, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. But here's what's interesting about this story. Here in this story, the proximate and the remote seem to be mutually exclusive. The, The divine intention was the exact opposite of human intention. Joseph's brothers had one goal. God had a different one. But the astounding reality here is that the proximate purpose, catch this, served the remote purpose. This did not absolve these brothers from from having to deal with what they did and having to answer for the sin they committed. Their intent and actions were absolutely evil, yet God deemed it good and let the brothers have their way with Joseph to a limited extent. I hope you're catching what I'm talking about tonight. It didn't make sense in the moment. Thrown in a pit, sold into slavery, Potiphar's wife, the baker, the butcher, all of these things. But God's purpose never changed. God's in the background of all of it. He's got an eternal purpose that there's no way for Joseph to even understand. And it never wavered. We look at Paul in Romans 8 and 28. He says, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. Here, Paul addresses the remote rather than the proximate. He's saying, hey, listen. This is bigger than me and you. And I'm not making fun, but it's bigger. Adam, it's bigger than your little problem today. It's it's bigger than your season, whatever it is in that list you're going through. 
all things work together for the good. Here Paul addresses these two together. I said all that to say this. The proximate must always be seen in the light of the remote. Always. No matter what you're going through, you got to pause and say, okay, God, I want to see it in light of the eternal. I have to. Stand with me tonight. First Corinthians 13 and 12, I quoted this earlier, but it talks about us seeing through a glass darkly. New Living says it like this, now we see things imperfectly, like a puzzling reflection in a mirror. You ever feel like that when you're going through it? When you're going through the season, you're doesn't look right. But then, speaking of heaven, we will see everything with perfect clarity. All that I know now is partial and incomplete, but then I will know everything completely just as God now knows me completely. First Samuel 17 and 28, another example of this. And Eliab, his oldest brother, David's oldest brother, heard when he spake unto the men. And Eliab's anger was kindled against David, and he said, Why camest thou down hither? And whom hast thou left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know thy pride. I know the naughtiness of thine heart. For thou art come down that thou mightest see the battle. You understand this situation? Eliab has been sitting there listening to Goliath for days. Mock the people of God. David shows up. You know the story well. Verse 29, though, says, And David says, speaking to Eliab, What have I now done? Why are you bringing all this stuff up? I say it like this, Eliab, that's all times and seasons. That's all under the heaven stuff. That's all stuff that really doesn't matter. And then he says, is there not a cause? Eliab, it's bigger than sheep. It's bigger than attitudes. It's bigger than minding your relationship. It's bigger than who gets the credit. It's bigger than that. There is a cause going on. It's called the purpose of God. And you know what David did with that mentality. He went out and he slayed Goliath because he understood there was a purpose. You hear me tonight? political landscape it doesn't change the purpose of God economy it doesn't change the purpose of God my health I don't like it when I'm sick but it doesn't change the purpose of God you say God doesn't care I didn't say that God does care but it doesn't change the purpose of God but what about my kids Mary You forgot you're part of something great. Don't forget there's something bigger going on. I I know you were I know you were in terror for three days, but Mary, don't forget what this is all about. Mary and Martha, different Mary. I'm gonna talk about sickness. Mary and Martha, you lost focus. And what does Jesus say? He says, hey, this sickness is not unto death. You're focused in on Lazarus' sickness. They're running to him. Jesus, if you'd have been here sooner, don't you understand? He's dead. And how does Jesus respond? He says, this sickness, you guys don't even understand what's going on. This sickness is not unto death. 
but unto the glory of God. He had a purpose in all of it. No, 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 you don't understand. My brother died. No, no, you don't understand. I'm getting ready to get glory out of something. I'm telling you, you got to get the perspective tonight. God's got a purpose. And it's never changed. We read through Ecclesiastes. And it listed all kinds of stuff. But he said, all of that's under heaven. We got to get our eyes on Jesus. I'll say one more thing tonight. There was a young man in this church years ago. I grew up with him. Played ball with him. He got very sick. And uh, he had walked away from God. And he got deathly sick. And uh, in this time of being sick, he made things right with God. It's beautiful. And we prayed earnestly for this young man. I'll never forget the day that I went to see him in rehab. He was basically slowly dying. They just stuck him in a rehab-type hospital. And I remember sitting there talking to him. I remember praying for him. And I was praying for God to heal him. And he stopped me. And he said, I want you to pray the will of God. And then he made a statement that I have never forgot. He said, I wasn't living for God when I got sick. And I don't think I would be if I wasn't sick. I'll tell you tonight that he died saved, prayed through full of the Holy Ghost. But I'm just here to tell you, You don't know what God's doing. God's God's got a purpose. And we read in Ecclesiastes tonight, he says, you're not going to understand the beginning from the end. It's not going to happen. You may understand all the times and seasons. You may go through all of them. But don't you ever forget it's bigger than times and seasons. It's the unchanging purpose of God. I know this is different for a Sunday night, but I've come to encourage somebody tonight. I don't know what you've been going through. I don't know what's been happening, but I'm here to tell you tonight, it's bigger than that. God's going to take care of that. that. That's nothing for God. God's got a plan. This sickness is not unto death. It's for the glory of God. God's going to do it. Uh, If you want to come and talk to God tonight, uh, these altars are open. But I'm here to tell you, God has got an unchanging purpose tonight. Uh, It will never change. It has never changed. God's got your situation under control. He's seen it from the very beginning. He knows exactly what he's doing. Take it by the hand tonight. Let God take you by the hand tonight. Come on, he's got a plan for you. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, it's an unchanging purpose tonight. Hallelujah.